Well, welcome everyone. My name is Charlene Margo and I'm the founder and director of the Parent Education Series and co-founder of new nonprofit, The Parent Venture. We are very fortunate to be one of the programs funded by the Sequoia Healthcare District. So we could not be more delighted tonight to be bringing you a wonderful presentation, helping kids thrive during the holidays and COVID-19. We are so grateful tonight to Dr. Aaron Nafak, who is here with us as our keynote and Pamela Kurtzman, CEO of the Sequoia Healthcare District. You'll be hearing more from them shortly. But before we get started, I just wanna tell you a little bit about how tonight is going to work before I hand it over to Pamela, okay? So if you need Spanish interpretation, we have with us interpreter Cynthia Henestrosa from the Sequoia Union High School District. If you need Spanish, there is the interpretation globe at the bottom of your screen. Click on the globe and then click on Spanish. Anyone else, if you see that interpretation button, you're welcome to leave it as is or click on English. We are speaking obviously in English. This event will be recorded and available for future viewing on the Sequoia Healthcare District website and also the Parent Education Video Library. So um, Dr. Nafak will be talking tonight for about 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes. And then after that, the program will be open to you, our attendees and for your questions. We are in a meeting format tonight, so if you feel comfortable leaving your camera on, we love to see everybody. And um, we will ask though that you put your questions, write your questions into the chat box. My parent venture partner, Bev Hartman and Jenny Bratton from the Healthcare District will be monitoring the chat. They'll be putting in resources relevant to tonight's presentation. And you should feel free to talk to us, talk to one another and put your questions there again into the chat button, okay? Let's see, after that, we will come back, Pamela and I, to join Dr. Nafak for some questions. So if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in, or you can do that also when we get to the Q&A portion of the evening. So I think that that is about it. We're going to be having an hour of content tonight, including both the short keynote and questions. So again, about 60 minutes. Right now, I'm going to hand it over to Pamela Kurtzman, the CEO of the Sequoia Healthcare District. Take it away, Pamela. <laughs> Thank you, Charlene. Welcome, everyone. It's uh, it's great to have you join us. I, I'm going to focus my um, most of my uh, talk tonight on on the um, the mental health supports that Sequoia Healthcare District is providing uh, to district residents. Um, before I hand it over, though, to Dr. Nafak, I want to give um, everybody just a really high level overview of uh, what Sequoia Healthcare District is, who we are, for those who don't know. Um, we are a local government agency. We were formed in 1946, and we were the first healthcare district in the state of California. There are now 78 healthcare districts. When we were formed, we were formed to build and to operate Sequoia Hospital, and that's what we did for over 50 years. And then in uh, 2007, we sold Sequoia Hospital. Uh, so we are no longer a part of the hospital, although we do have many uh, relationships with the hospital. Um, we are a totally separate entity. We have a separate board of directors. We have five district board of directors who are elected by our residents. Dr. Nate Back is one of those uh, members. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a second. Um, we uh, have um, uh, seven different cities within our geography, and that's where we focus our funding. So we are funded through property taxes from the cities of Atherton and Belmont, Portola Valley, Redwood City, San Carlos Woodside, and portions uh, and a Portola Valley, and then portions of about a third of Foster City. And um, our annual income is around um, $16 million a year. And it is the district's goal and really our priority to get all of those dollars back out into the community. And uh, we have a number of initiatives that we fund, um, big initiatives, and then generally we're a funder. So we fund about 70, 75 different local nonprofits, and they serve uh, about 70,000 district residents directly every year um, through programs such as uh, mental health support, um, through physical fitness ex programs, um, through education and health education, very focused on health. Um, and uh, we also have um, our signature programs that is our Healthy Schools Initiative, which is an annual program about four and a half million dollars. Uh, and that supports 
things like school nurses and a wellness coordinator uh, in each of the eight school districts within the geography of those areas that I just described. Um, it supports a big physical fitness program for Redwood City School District, um, San Carlos, a um, number of initiatives. I would love you to check it out on our website. It's led by our uh, physician um, pediatrician, Dr. Karen Lee, who is with us tonight. Um, and we also fund Ravenswood Medical Clinic about a million a year so that um, some of our lower income residents have benefits such as um, um, oral health, medical, clinical, and we also fund uh, Samaritan House. And that's about a million a year too. And the rest of it, we put out back, as I said, back out into the community. And our community is very diverse. We have about 60% of our population is people of color. About 37% of those populations right now are experiencing overcrowded housing conditions. About 40% have limited English. Um, our LGBTQ communities um, make up a high percentage of the homeless youth that we're serving. Um, so and th these are what we're learning and knowing that we're finding even more in, in the pandemic. Um, and immigrant families um, are specifically um, challenged at these times. And so our priorities during COVID have really been to help support those most vulnerable in our community, ensure that everybody has equal access to health services. Um, and, uh, and we do that with our focus on, on equity, on an equity lens, make sure all of our residents have, have that. Um, and so what we're finding too is some of the other challenges um, for our residents have been, and it doesn't matter whether it's uh, your high income, low income from Atherton or Fair Oaks, people are really struggling social emotional challenges right now. And so that's really why we um, wanted to bring forward some support uh, for our community by Dr. Aaron Nafak. Uh, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about him and then I'm going to hand it over to him. And so um, let me tell you about Dr. Nafak. He's a unique specimen. <laughs> uh, there aren't a lot of developmental and behavioral pediatricians. Um, he's one of two, I believe, and you can correct me, Dr. Nafek, if I'm wrong, in, in the county. Um, he's currently practicing at Palo Alto Medical Foundation in San Carlos. And for the past two years, he served on the board of Sequoia Healthcare District, representing parts of San Carlos and Redwood City. So we're in zones. So we have each of our board of directors lives in the zone that they represent but we're also kind of really represent all of our, all of our, our area, each of our directors, but they live in, so Aaron lives in the zone of San Carlos. Uh, he uh, has a background in public health and prior to his election on the board, he served in several leadership and advocacy roles within the American Academy of Pediatrics. He lives with his wife and two children in San Carlos. And in pre-COVID times, you could find him coaching his kids uh, in sports around town. And despite all that has happened in 2020, he still feels the glow from the Dodgers World Series championship. <laughs> Good for you to find that special sweet spot that keeps you going every morning. Oh, I see you have some claps there. <laughs> um, and so uh, I wanna really give uh, Dr. Nafak the, the, the tonight's um, the time for everybody to have time to ask him questions and to hear what he has to say, because that's really why you're here. So I'm going to hand it over to you. And thanks, everybody, again. Uh, well, <clears throat> thanks, Pamela. Uh, it's a really kind introduction. And um, yes, I am still basking in the glow. That's what this light is shining off the dome of my head of my Dodger World Series. I like to start off by you know just sticking it in here to all the Giants fans that are probably listening in. Um, all right, I see a lot of participants just logged off. Uh, so um, as, as you heard in the introduction, um, my name is Aaron Nafak. I'm uh, one of the a developmental and behavioral pediatrician and practice locally uh, with the Palo Alto Medical Foundation. Um, for a lot of you who probably don't know what a developmental and behavioral pediatrician is, there's not very many of us. Um, I'm a pediatric specialist and I basically deal with kind of um, abnormal child development or atypical child development. Um, so a lot of my practice revolves around things like autism, ADHD, uh, learning disabilities, developmental delay, things like that. Um, and so that's what I do kind of on my day to day. Um, and then um, as, as you heard, I have for the last couple of years, uh, I've had the privilege of representing 
San Carlos and uh, Redwood City on the board of the healthcare district. Um, and, and Pam will give, I think, a nice little uh, overview of what we do. Uh, I'm going to share my screen because I put a few slides together tonight for my portion of the talk. And so we'll go through that. And then I wanted to hopefully um, we'll share, uh, save the majority of our time uh, just for conversation, for questions that you may have, um, because I know we're all trying to work our way through this um, collaboratively and together. Um, so give me a second here. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can all uh, see this here. So, um, Jed, got some thumbs up. Excellent. Um, so, yes, the the title of our talk today was Helping Kids Thrive During the Holidays and COVID-19. Um, in retrospect, I think Thrive is probably a bit optimistic, um, but I think to do the best we can, helping our kids be the best they can be during this time, not just in the holidays, but in going through what's sure to be a challenging winter, I think, for, for all of us. Um, I know we've got good news on the vaccine front this last week or so, but it's going to take some time and, um, and we've got some tough months ahead. So hopefully some tips and strategies in here that will help all of us. Um, oh, uh oh, sorry. Okay, well, let me try that one more time. I don't know what happened. Um, that was weird. Okay. Okay. Hmm. You guys see my screen still or no? Not at all. Okay. Um, let's see. What can we do here? Try one more time. To do there we go in it again okay yeah yeah got it all right yep. you can go full screen i'm trying to yeah see there it goes okay very yeah, beautiful okay sorry about that 2020 what are you gonna do so uh, quickly, uh, what I wanted to go over, basically I broke it into three parts. Uh, a quick acknowledgement of where we've been. I think it's really important to kind of understand the context of what we're talking tonight. Um, a little bit about where we are uh, in terms of some early research that's come up on the effects of children to this point uh, and on all of us, and then kind of what we can do moving forward. So where we've been, this is 2020, dumpster fire. I think we can all just agree on that. Um, but it's really important to actually step back and think and realize where we're at, right? We are living through a failed national response to a global health pandemic. Um, something that maybe we've all been kind of made immune to the craziness of the last few years, but to think that thought a few years ago would have been unfathomable, that our country would fail in its response to a global health pandemic. But that's really where we sit tonight. 300,000 of our fellow citizens are dead. Many, many more have been infected. Our, our, on a national level, we failed in our response. Um, when our national leaders failed in this response, it went down to the state level and you had 50 states scrambling to do their own thing, patchwork, set up to fail. And they all have at one point or time or another and in some more drastic than others. As we talked tonight in California, you can make a really good argument that California in many ways has failed. We're back in being shut down. Uh, cases are still skyrocketing. ICUs are full. Um, a lot of this was preventable. So here we are, we sit tonight together, having so gone nine months already, at least, if you, depending on when you want to start your clock, through a failed response to a global health pandemic, something that would have been unfathomable a long time ago. You layer that on with threats to democracy, with rises in racial tensions. I mean, this year has really brought it all come crashing down. And I don't mean to just be here and be a big downer, but I think what we really have to understand is that uh, we have to have our expectations 
in the right spot for what we are able to do. We as, as, as husbands and fathers and mothers and daughters and sons um, and individuals in our community, when you're living through, when the structure above you has failed and the national and, and basically on your state level has failed, what are you left with? You're left with what I consider local heroes, right? The only way that we've come this far uh, and it hasn't been even worse than it's been is because of the, of the local effort. Um, and so I consider, when I think about the local efforts, I've considered people who couldn't pass the buck because there was no one else to pass the buck to. So county health, your school boards, your superintendents, your teachers, your some of my colleagues in the medical profession who, you know, over the course of a weekend started respiratory care clinics they'd never done before. Um, your frontline workers, people in the grocery store, um, these are your local heroes. And then when you really peel it down, what's the most basic unit in our country? It's the family. And so everybody here, everybody's on this call, everybody who, you know, sixth night of Hanukkah and you're joining me for a little bit of time or taking time out after dinner or before, uh, everyone here who's got themselves to this point, who's worried about parents, who's worried about kids, who's worried about siblings, um, you're all heroes in my book to have done what we've done. We are all heroes in my book uh, to have gotten this far. Um, and it's incredible and we have to remember that. We have to remember that our nation on a, on, a, on a national level failed us and yet we're okay. We've made it this far um, and that's important. I just feel like that context is really important for thinking about how we move forward. So having said that, um, where are we now? Where are we nine months into this pandemic? There is some limited research starting to come in and uh, I'll go over a little bit of what's come in already. I think what we all feel intuitively is probably a lot of you agree with what I said before, right? This has been crazy. Nobody thought at this time last year, that <laughs> this is where you would be. Um, if you look at like the, the photo, uh, there's a lot of these uh, year in review photo things. And you look at like last New Year's Eve in, in Times Square or something. And it's, it's kind of mind boggling that that was you know, less than a year ago now. But what we all feel intuitively is that this has been hard on all of us. So we've all had nights we couldn't sleep. We all feel anxious about things. We all, and it, and it runs the gamut, right? Um, some people are worried about their livelihoods, their home. Some people are worried about their health. Some people have people they're mourning. Um, other people are trying to juggle two full-time parents working from home and teaching school. Um, and it goes everything in between. But what we all feel intuitively is that this has been hard on us and on our kids. What I've seen clinically, uh, I, I see a different slice, as I was saying before. Um, I see kids with, like I said, who have already entered into the pandemic with some behavioral challenges already, um, some learning issues already. For the patients I've seen and the families I work with, um, it's been, an, for a large part, an unmitigated disaster. Um, and it, that's just unfortunately true. And we've done as best we can schools have done, the teachers, like my own kids, I think about my own kids' teachers, they've done as best they can. But for a kid with severe ADHD, sitting in front of a screen just isn't gonna cut it. Um, and if you have severe learning disabilities and you normally get one-on-one -on -one resource tutoring and now you're getting that, trying to get that online, it's just not enough. So we know for the patients I've seen, my families that I work with, everyone's really struggling every single day. I have families that have moved to states that are open. They've said, you know what, I disagree with this governor politically, but he's opening his schools and we're moving and I can't blame them. Um, and I've had people hiding out in different states where they can try to get other resources going. So what I've seen clinically, it's been really bad. Maybe the only <laughs> bright light is uh, some of my kids that I work with social anxiety, this has been fine. They're doing fine. Um, they're like in their pajamas at home and they're doing great. But really, for the most part, from what I've seen clinically, um, it's been tough. And I know I, I don't see, I see a skewed population. Uh, and so I know other people are doing well. People are, some are just getting by, some are even thriving, um, but not, not what I've seen clinically. So as I mentioned briefly, I wanted to talk about what some early research is showing. Um, on the education front, and really you should have the other Dr. Nafak here, for those of you who know my wife used to be on the school board in town, as a PhD in this, but she said I could at least put this slide up. Um, we know we're seeing growing educational inequity. Um, 
there were already gaps going in, the gaps have widened. Um, so McKinsey report said that uh, in the fall, when they looked back, white students had lost about one to three months worth of math, students of color, three to five months. Um, they project if, if things continue for the next six months, um, students of color could lose almost a year, um, white students less, but everyone's falling behind, but the gaps are widening, the gaps are already there. This fall, school districts across the country are reporting a ton more uh, failing grades. We've seen decreases in college applications and financial aid, um, and particularly from groups um, that are low income, first generation. The estimates are tens of millions of dollars needed to close those gaps. Um, I don't know if it'll be coming or not. Nobody does, but we'll see what happens after January 20th. On more my front, on the social, on the social emotional behavioral front, um, some early parent surveys and, and early research has shown increase in social isolation, which I think intuitively makes sense. Uh, we know about limited physical activity. Um, probably a lot of us have added the COVID-15. Um, there's limited access to some school-based clinics now. So services that we're getting there, either health or other resources through the school, speech therapy, occupational therapy, um, those, are, those access to that has been limited. We have a lot of behavioral challenges to do disruptions in routines. And how that shows that for a lot of young kids is you may see increasing faintness, you may see added distraction, irritability, fear. Those are emotions that we're seeing more of in our kids. Last little bit of early data for you guys, um, some anecdotal data of increase in substance use in adolescents. A third of parents have reported uh, emotional or mental health issues. Uh, and we know that parent stress, which I said at the very outset, is something we're all under. Parent stress, for different reasons, negatively affects your children. Um, and, but it's, un, it's unrealistic to think that you're going to be hiding this from your kids, right? um, especially when we're all together all the time. Uh, kids are intuitive, and they'll see it. Um, so that's where kind of the early research is showing us. Uh, and there will be much more data to come. There will probably be people who are building their whole research careers for the next generation on the effects of this last uh, nine months in the coming time frame. So we'll have to keep abreast of that. Um, some will show more resilience than others, but uh, in general, the early research is, is not good. Okay. So we know this is all tough, and I've spent a bunch of minutes now totally depressing everybody. Um, so sorry, <laughs> but I thought that was an important context. Um, so what can we do about it? What can we do during the holidays? What can we do moving beyond? So for the next few minutes, I'm just going to go over some, some general guidelines and behavioral guidelines some maybe more specific advice. Um, there'll be stuff in here for older kids, stuff in here for younger kids. So uh, for those of you, depending on who you have in your family, uh, you'll find some of this hopefully helpful. Other parts of it, it may not relate, but I wanted to kind of try to give advice that I thought would be helpful um, for anybody. So here's some really good guidelines, I think. Uh, this slide in particular, these, these notes for this time period in the holidays and, in, and through their winter. So the first thing is to address your children's fears. Um, ignoring them isn't going to help, isn't going to help it. And we really do need to be open and honest about it in a way that's reassuring. So for younger kids, you know, you don't have to dive into it too much, but you can just say, mommy and daddy are here. We're doing our best. We are going to get through this together. For the older kids, uh, you can get a little more in, in depth and detail into it. When questions come up and they have been coming up and they will continue to come up, answer them simply and ask them honestly, why am I not seeing grandma this year for, for the holidays? Or why only in the backyard separated by you know, six feet? Or why aren't we doing the things we normally do? Um, you can be honest about it. Um, but then kind of try to say, this is what it is. This is where we're at. Um, but then remind your kids that there are things we can do. Right? The, the, the one thing is to try to give them a little sense of control. Um, control goes a long, long way uh, to making uh, kids feel a little bit less anxious. When you're in conversation with your older kids, with your teenagers, um, guiding questions are always good. And what I mean by that is um, drawing them into the conversation in a solutions oriented. Uh, you know, I realize this is hard. I realize you're missing this or that. What can we do? 
what do you think? Can you come up with some brainstorming ideas that are safe to something we can do socially during the holidays? Or uh, what can we send someone to brighten their day? Um, little things, big things. But really kind of getting those guiding questions to get your older children involved is important. Keeping in touch with your loved ones. I think we've all gone through periods of time, probably in the last nine months, where we were trying to be a lot in touch and other times where we need to pull back. The holidays, particularly for our kids, are times where they want to see those faces that they normally see, right? Holidays are often a time where, you know, I know for my family, um, we go down to Los Angeles and we, my kids have all these cousins that they see once or twice a year. And over the time they've gotten to grow close and now it's a time where you know, they can't. So this last weekend we hosted a, a Zoom Hanukkah party and um, at least we could see everyone's face. Um, and then model how to manage things. And I'll get back to this one because that's, and I'll probably end with that one because that's a really important thing to come up with. So some, this is called Behavioral Management 101 because this is stuff that's not necessarily specific to COVID or um, you know, going through the winter and these stressful times, but it's things that can be really, really helpful, um, more geared towards the younger kids, but really, really helpful, I think, for a lot of our kids that we have. So catch your child being good. So this is something that I talk a lot, a lot in my clinic and I try to remind myself as a parent and it's so easy to say and I fail all the time in my own house. Um, kids are downstairs, they would probably tell you that's true. Um, but basically it's this, if you're in a cycle where you're like, feel like you're kind of saying no and, and, being, and giving negative consequences, really easiest thing to do to break it is just spend a day praising things and, and catch them doing good. So, it, and it can be anything. It can be, hey, I, I, you know, I saw that you put away that toy when you were done playing with it, great job. Or uh, I saw that when your brother asked you a question, you responded nicely. Um, so anything that your child does can be the smallest thing, but catch them being good, giving that praise, it really helps. Providing structure, kids and adults, really, we all do best with routines and expectations. So during the holiday time when they're, the little bit of structure that their maybe distance learning has given them is now falling away, you may wanna consider adding some extra structure to your days and having them involved in, in those decisions. Um, predictability, as I think we all feel, it's comforting. Um, so one thing you can do is like a visual daily schedule for kids where they can actually see what's going to happen all day. It doesn't have to fill in every minute of the day, but if they, if they can see what's going, like provides them that predictability, let them have input on it. Um, a sense of control again, I think is really important and then make time for quality time. Um, and this, like I said, during the holidays, hopefully it's not as hard as, but during the run up to now and in through the rest of the winter, Try to take, and it can be a short amount of time, 10 or 20 minutes, just a few times a week, get in there with whatever they choose. Say, hey, this is your time, I'm with you. Let's do some play, let's do some fun. You build, you keep that positive momentum going. And then when you do have to set limits, you've got some goodwill to work with. So for the our younger kids um, that I've seen in my clinic and that I've seen in my house, um, younger kids cannot often articulate the feelings. They're less able to problem solve them when they do. So a lot of our younger kids, you'll see a lot of more increase in disruptive behavior, uh, particularly during this time when things are different for them. But again, I think this applies for really all of COVID. They'll show up in non-compliance, being oppositional, tantrums, some behaviors you may have thought you've already gone through may kind of come back. And that's typical and kind of appropriate for kids who really can't articulate what they're thinking and feeling. So, for those times, if you can cut it off at the pass by figuring out where your kids' triggers are, then that's a good way of handling it. And don't forget the basics. Um, eat, sleep, move, right? It applies to all of us too. And I'm guilty of, as guards of probably doing poorly in all three as we've gone through this pandemic. Um, but as much as we can for the kids, um, trying to remember their routines, the basics of the day, getting those three things in there um, will be as helpful as we can get. Parent attention is a good behavioral management tool. What I mean, um, what I mean is a lot of behavior is attention seeking. A lot of times for young kids, there's not that much difference between negative attention and positive attention. They want the attention. So if you can, if there's a negative behavior. If you can ignore it, it'll get worse initially. Your kids are gonna double down for a week or two, particularly if they've been successful getting your attention before. But if you can stick with it, it will start to get better. For our older kids, um, if, the kid, if your older child is upset, but calm enough to talk through, 
then help them identify that emotion and and don't try to invalidate it. Try to, even if you disagree, even if the, how you think why, it doesn't matter. It's their, it's their experience. So help them identify the emotion, often anxiety these days, maybe depression, um, and say, yeah, absolutely. I hear you and that's right and I understand. Some other things you can do, uh, make sure you have good communication with them at all times. If you're going out in the house these days, where you're going, how long you'll be gone. Um, even kids who are used to being left by themselves, they may need a little bit extra of that during this time. Keep healthy routines, I mentioned that. Uh, a word about bedtime. Um, so during this time, if any, I'm guessing all of your kids are off of the bedtime routine they had uh, before COVID. Mine are, everything's a little bit shifted late. And that's typical. Um, when, uh, when kids go through times of not feeling well, they're not, and they're worried or disturbed, you'll see it in, in bedtime a lot. Um, for your young kids, try to keep that same routine that you have, even if it is a little bit late shifted, right? Whatever routine it was, whether it was reading or listening to music or snuggling together, try to keep that same routine going. Um, for your older kids, acknowledge that it's probably late shifted. It's probably later than you would have preferred or that you would have had in the before time. Um, that's okay, but we don't want it to get out of control. And as always, for us to turn off those cell phones an hour before bed. Guilty, again, of not following my own advice a lot, but it does very much help. And I think for the our older kids in particular, it's really helpful. Um, so a, a final advice uh, slide here, and then I'll, I'll try to wrap things up so we can have some time to chat. Um, I said this initially, so modeling, managing your feelings. So what do I mean? Well, so during this time, during the last nine months, during the next, I don't know, six to nine months probably, um, maybe less, um, we're having a lot of different feelings, a lot of different emotions, but it's a chance to grow. It is a chance for you to grow and it's a chance for you to help your kids grow as well. And this, like I said, I think this is more towards your middle and older childhood folks. So you want to intentionally manage your feelings. So what I mean is you want to call out what you're doing. Uh, we all have our feelings. We all have our way of dealing with them. We all say, oh, I'm going to go out for a run or I'm going to go to bed early tonight or stay up late tonight because I need some time for myself. Um, but what we want to do is be really intentional uh, with our feelings and how we're managing them because it's helpful to set a model for our kids. So I put like a, a few examples here. So when you feel like you're failing, we've all been there, I'm guessing. I've been there a lot. Uh, when you feel like you're failing either as a parent or in your job or whatever, um, most of us have kind of worked through ways of being like, you know what, 2020, I did the best I can. And basically what that is, is self-forgiveness, right? You're saying, hey, it's okay. You know, back to my very opening slide global health pandemic, failed response, I'm doing okay, I, I'm, I'm okay. So that, that act of self-forgiveness, um, but say it out loud um, and, and be explicit to what you're, with your kids with what you're doing. We're all frustrated, we're all angry at times. We all wanna, we all lose our temper. Um, and what you can do is realizing, okay, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to empathize with that other person. I'm trying to understand where that frustration comes from. So when you say, oh, we're all angry at times, we all get frustrated, then you carry it the next step forward. Well, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to learn empathy for that person. Or I don't know how to handle this. Um, we've all probably have been at that point too. And what you're basically saying is, well, I'm trying to learn how to process this. I'm going to learn. I don't know, but I'm going to learn. That's growth mindset that we often talk a lot about that too. So if we can find a way to model managing feelings during the holidays in particular, when the feelings are going to be probably exacerbated and magnified and then moving forward through what's going to be a tough winter and then hopefully a good spring when we can talk about managing positive emotions. Um, I think that'll be really helpful. So those were some general tips and guidelines uh, and, and we can talk more about questions if you have a, or specific examples you want to go over, but I thought just to give you guys some general strategies to think through as we move through the holidays would be the best. Final thoughts on where we go. Uh, I want to leave you off with this. So, as we move forward, we have to do this together. Um, we, as I said before, a lot of us, we've been adrift kind of our own family boats and asked to kind of figure out our way through the storm. But as we come out the other side, and as we take stock of what we've been through and what our kids have been through, 
we have to really think about how we do this as a community. Different families have chosen different paths, right? Some people out of necessity, some people out of opportunity. Uh, some people have got their pods, some people have private tutors, some people have two parents working in essential jobs. Some people are single parents on their own trying to make do. People have made different choices and we have to respect that. We have to respect that we all tried to make the best choices we had with the information we had at that time, as did our local you know, partners in all of this, our teachers, our school boards, county health folks. Um, we, have to, we have to respect that. We can't finger point at the end of this. We can't say, well, you did that. And that was, you know, we, we cannot, we can't squabble. We can't fall apart. Um, it's really gonna be the communities that need to come together. If you have to point a finger, I say there's only, I'm gonna, in my one political thing, Trump, McConnell, no one else deserves a finger pointed at them. Those are the only two people who could have made this different. Must accept kids and meet them where they're at. So when we get done, when we get done with this, when we come back to schools and schools are open and some of our kids didn't miss a beat. It was like they were gone for a long weekend and they're fine. And other kids are much further behind. And some people have clinical anxiety they're still dealing with. And some people uh, don't, like, we just have to really understand where our kids are, where our community of kids are. And we have to work for all of them together. So we have to advocate for everybody. Yeah, uh, we're all good advocates for our own kids. But when we come out of this, we have to be advocates for our, all of them. We have to talk to our the, their teachers and say, hey, I, I'm, I'm here to do whatever for my kid, but like, what does the rest of the class need? Or talk, you know, or, or partner with your school boards and their efforts, because there's going to be huge needs coming up. So maybe you can volunteer as a local tutor. Everyone's going to have a little bit to give, I hope. Um, some people have come through well, and maybe maybe your give is a financial give, but maybe your give is a little bit of your time um, or some expertise. But we're all going to have to do this together. And we're going to have to partner together with, with, all of our, with all of our local heroes that I started off talking about. Um, so that those are my thoughts. Those are kind of what I had to say tonight. Um, hopefully some of that was helpful and I didn't ramble too much for you. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to um, well, Pamela and Charlene here, and we can open up to some questions. Stop well, thank you, Aaron, for all that wonderful advice. That was really incredible. Um, lots of things to think about, parents, community members. So Aaron, before we take questions from our attendees, and please do, anyone online here, type your questions into the chat comments, questions, we are here for you. Let me start with a few that have come in earlier from the community. Here's one that I know is on lots of parents' minds. How can I tell if my child has a mental health issue or if it's just basic teenage moodiness and kind of COVID angst? Yeah, that's the hardest thing. Um, I, early in the week, I diagnosed someone with, I said, you have 2020. There's nothing actually <laughs> diagnosably wrong you're a 13 year old who's lived through this year and you, you could use a little help. Um, though that's kind of your teenage 2020 angst. Where it crosses the line, I guess, is where is when you start to think about what is my child's job on the day to day? Um, and are they able to handle those functions? So angst is fine, but what we're asking of our kids these days is what is mostly to go to school, uh, to be able to stick on their Zoom, get some work done, um, you know, most of their extracurriculars have been pulled back. So there's, there's not a lot that we're asking, but what is, their, what is their child's function in your house, in your family? And are they able to still meet that? If the behaviors are getting in the way to the point where they're not able to meet kind of the basics like day-to-day, -day, what we expect functionally of our kids, that's when I, I'd be concerned that you've crossed the line and you have like a clinical disorder um, that needs to see you know, someone like me or psychologist or psychiatrist or start with your general pediatrician actually, and, and they can do a lot too but that's how I use that's how I use my guiding line are they able to do their day-to-day -day functions that we would ask them to okay thank you great answer uh Dr. Nafak you touched on this briefly but here's a parent who asked my kids love the holidays and they're really angry that we're not traveling to go see their cousins and grandma and grandpa and they say you know my friends are why can't we do you have any suggestions to help parents who are struggling with that? Yeah. Well, first of all, acknowledge it. Probably agree with it. 
I get angry too. <laughs> I feel like I've spent a lot of the last, you know, nine months yelling at a TV screen or yelling at something like, what? Um, so acknowledge that anger and, say, and it's okay. Um, explain that every family has different choices and every family has different situations and you don't know. You don't, and there's so much we don't know. Why is that family traveling? Maybe it's likely to be grandma's last Christmas or something, you know, and, and they, they're willing to take it, or maybe they quarantine for two weeks and are doing, so you don't, you don't know, you never know what's behind someone else's decision. So I think it's important to say, you know, I agree with you. I hear that anger. I feel that anger. And you know, let's maybe spend some time dreaming about what we're going to be able to do in six months or this time next year when we're back. Like let's plan, let's you know, spend some time doing a fun mental exercise of planning something big for next year. Um, and then also just remember, we don't know what other people's situations are and, and, and make sure you kind of put that, that hammer that point through and kind of talk about the idea of empathy. Yeah, and I love your advice to really involve your children in these conversations as much as you can, right? It depends obviously upon their developmental level. But as you say, guided questions, you know, even really little kids can come up with lots of ideas for things to do as a family, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it's the really little kids who still do the imaginative play that are much better at coming up with fun ideas. You know, my my sixth grader downstairs is kind of like, I don't know. I'll go read again. But, you know, the younger one has got the crazy imagination. And even though some of her ideas are out of left field, um, it's great. And, and she has fun just idea generating. So that's something that we can always pull through. Okay. So here is a parent who says, my child is an introvert and they've actually done pretty well during remote learning. But now she's really nervous because her school is going to start in-person learning again in January. Do you have any advice for that? transition for somebody, as you mentioned, who's been okay mm -hmm. with school at home, kind of nervous about going back again. Yeah. So I think that falls like the one group that I mentioned that is doing pretty well. So introverts or people with a little bit of social anxiety, um, this has been cool. They're, they're okay in some respects. Um, and it is going to be scary to reemerge. It's going to be a big transition. And even for kids who say they're excited to go back, like it's been nine months since my kids have set foot in the school. My son's at a We'll go back to a wholly different school. Um, it's going to be a challenging. So one thing is to kind of role model a little bit um, or to kind of role play about what it might look like, uh, depending on what safety guidelines are in place to like go to the school if you can. I don't know, may not let you in yet, but um, go ahead of time. Say, this is where you're going to go. This is how it's going to be on the first day. Um, so try to kind of give them whatever exposure you can. Um, Again, it's, it's, we have the safety guidelines, whether you'll be let actually like into a classroom, but maybe this, this is our walk to school, remember? Or this is our drive to school, remember? Um, and do it a few times. So I think trying to break down those barriers um, and then also just approaching it with empathy and understanding that um, it's gonna be a rough transition. Uh, for this example, this child in this example, it'll be challenging for all of our kids when they, whenever there is a transition back, it's gonna be different uh, at first particularly. and to expect those first few weeks to have some of the disruptive behaviors I talked about at the beginning. So you, you know, they may be more irritable or clingy or uh, easier to tantrum if it's a younger child. So expect that and just understand they're kind of working through a transition. That's really good advice. I, it makes me think about kind of like we did when our kids were kindergartners. You drive by the school, then you go to the steps of the school, then you'd actually go on campus. May have to do that. You know, we have middle schoolers who've never been to middle school, right? Yeah. It's going to be tough. Okay, here's the million dollar question, Dr. Nafak, that every parent wants to know. Um, my kid is playing too many video games, too hooked on their electronics. They don't really care about their schoolwork. What do we do? <laughs> if you could solve uh, that, we would have the whole thing down. Yeah, I would say, you know, before 2020, I spent most of my public talks arguing and pushing for limits in screen time. I gave like, all these presentations to school districts and talked about the importance of those, those limits and those boundaries. And then this year I was like, ah, never mind what I said before. <laughs> um, so, but it is a challenge, right? Um, and if, if you find that your child is unable to agree with you on limits, like setting a family media plan, um, that's something we used to talk about in the beforehand. If you go to uh, healthychildren.org or just type in family media plan AAP, this uh, ironically on a screen will come up and you can work through 
for the course of your day, here's how much time you spend on Zoom, here's how much time you have to do this. So let's plot out for all of us, parents too, what your actual screen time, video game time is. And you wanna to try to involve them in that conversation, I think, and, and get them to agree. If you find that um, you, there's tons of conflict, if you find that um, limits can't be set, uh, you may be looking at some signs of, of more underlying like emotional needs, right? So um, I think if you kind of work your way through some, trying to set some limits, trying to get buy-in, doing a family media plan and nothing's working, that's when you want to think, hmm, this might be a sign that they're, they're using this as a kind of a coping mechanism for something else. And then you want to reach out, I think, for extra help. So, you know, thank you everybody who's been writing questions. Very vulnerable, very sensitive. I will not use anybody's names. Here's a parent who asked them, boy, believe me, I, we all empathize with this. How mad is too mad? I am sorry to say my husband and I have been swearing around our kids and we have been angry. Any advice? It's just, we know this is a hard time to moderate your emotions. Yeah. How mad is too mad? Um... From a kid's perspective, if they're breaking things and hurting others, that's too mad. Um, from our perspective, uh, I mean, you're dropping an F-bomb here and there. I mean, I've done it, we've all have. Um, I'm sure we've all had some more open conflicts, uh, perhaps with spouses and others as we've tried to navigate this hard situation. Um, obviously from a parenting standpoint, you know, anytime you're nearing a point of touching someone in anger, that's obviously too mad. Um, uh, but I think from our kids' perspective, it's breaking things and, and causing physical harm to like siblings or, or, or others. That's really where we want to say, you know, if you can't, you can redirect it into a pillow or a punching bag or whatever, then that's not too mad. That's nice. But um, that's a, I know that's a really sensitive question. I appreciate someone asking it. Um, and it's, it's a hard time. And, and we know that, um, that reports of child abuse are actually way down during the pandemic. And we don't think it's because child abuse is way down during the pandemic, but it's that those who are of us remanded reporters are seeing less kids. Um, so we'll, there's probably a silent pandemic there too. That's very serious. Wow, thank you. That is a kind of a scary thought. And you know, parents, we advise this and so does our friend, Dr. Iran McGinn, who we feature in the parent forums, that if you do lose your cool with your kids, apologize. Go back and say, you know, mom really lost it. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I'll do better next time. They'll they'll feel better for it. So it, it happens to everybody, but you can really make it better by simply apologizing. Okay, this is a question that is important. I don't know if you can answer it or not, Aaron. How do you advise parents who cannot access special education services because they're only offered via Zoom? I talk about it every day. Yeah, that's been every conversation I've had now for nine months, multiple times a day in my clinic. Um, it's really, really challenging. Uh, so um, I think that one thing is to try and then to understand that, look, that this is just not working we need to take a pause, right? Because if you're, if you're trying to do speech therapy through Zoom and it's, your kid is not there, cannot attend, um, rather than like adding this extra 45 minutes of frustration to your, to your day where you're yelling at them or they're yelling at you or you're there at this person on the screen, um, you may just have to pause it. Um, or you know, look elsewhere or just understand that, um, understand that we're all gonna be in that boat, understand that a lot of kids are going to be in that boat. We're all feeling that, oh my gosh, my child's going to fall behind. And it, yes, all of our kids are going to be a little bit behind. The hope is that as we come out of this, we can all work together to find ways to increase those resources. Um, and so be okay if you need to take a break. Um, it's, it's okay if you need to take a pause on some of those services, even though we all know that you know, it, it means that progress will slow down for a little bit of time. But if, this, if the tele stuff is just not working and, and we're at the height of a pandemic surge and there's just nothing in person that you can get privately, then, then maybe take a pause. Maybe ask the school district if, hey, you know, you get X amount of hours a, a year in my IEP, can I bank some of them uh, and try again a little bit later? Um, it, it's gonna have to be a collaborative effort on the other end because there's no easy answers to that question. 
Okay, thank you. Good question and good advice, Dr. Nafak. And parents, you know, we tell you and we mean it that the most important thing is your relationship with your child. And I think Dr. Nafak has been really clear about that. AP Calculus will be there tomorrow, but the core value of why we're here with our kids, that's the most important thing. So speaking of which, this is a really good question um, and a sensitive one again. Parent asks, my child is doing fine with academics, but he's developed some behavioral tics over the past few months that appear to be anxiety related. Is that something that you'd advise that we address with a professional? When it comes to tics, which are very common in kids, uh, and I don't know the age of your child, but just the natural course of tics is they kind of rise or peak around age 12 and then they kind of go back down. Tics will generally wax and wane on their own. And we usually become concerned about them in only a couple of instances. Uh, one is kind of there's like a six month cutoff. If they've been around for six months, then a little more chronic. And two is if they're disruptive, right? If they're disruptive to your child or disruptive to family or classmates, then we want to try to find a way. So if a child is having tics, yes, it's probably in this case due to some underlying anxiety. If it's not disruptive and it's only been a little bit of time, then I would kind of let it be, right? Because it, is it by chance by kind of drawing attention to it and if you make it a thing you may kind of increase tension there and increasing there um sometimes it's easy to say hey do you realize you're doing that and they say oh no and then they kind of become aware and then you can sometimes it's really easy but ticks are probably related to anxiety and if they do last long or they are disruptive then you want to look at there's therapy techniques it's about kind of raising awareness and, and habit reversal Sometimes we do anxiety medication. We want to talk to, you know, my, someone like me or your pediatrician or therapist. Um, so there are cutoffs for when we, we intervene and other times where we kind of just say, okay, that's part of childhood and it'll likely go on its own. Okay. Aaron, I'm going to segue into another question, but just quickly, um, a parent asks, can you define tick for us, please? <laughs> sure. Um, not the bug. <laughs> yeah, not the bug. Uh, is a repetitive motor movement or vocalization that is done without conscious thought. So the most common one is a throat clearing or like a shoulder shrug or an eye blink grimace. It can be more complex than that, but those are the simple things. Okay, and then here's a question, good segue, speaking of behaviors, and I'll just bet this is happening a lot as people are living on top of one another. Question, how do you ignore a behavior of a young child if other members of your family insist on paying attention to the child's behavior and telling them not to do it? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I smile and laugh just because I, I just think about all of our multi-generational families or just my own family and trying to get the grandparents on the same page. And I know a couple of the grandparents are on this call right now, so I'm going to be careful what I say. <laughs> um, hi, mom. Um, but um, I, I think the really important thing when you're dealing with caregivers is to be on the same page, is to uh, have a conversation on the side about what your strategy is and why. Uh, and find a compromise um, and explain to them the, the goals and the reasoning behind your behavior and try to come together because um, that inconsistency, kids will just exploit that. They are s smart little buggers and they will figure out their weak link um, and uh, the behaviors you're trying to manage will probably get worse on you. So um, I, yeah, it's really just important to get people on the same page as much as possible. Okay, let's take a question about outdoors. We're gonna shift here. If it's too cold to walk outside, what are other options indoors to accommodate that feeling of going out to have a nature walk to relieve anxiety, especially for young kids on the autism spectrum who can't really express how they're feeling? Okay, that's, that's a complicated one. I was with you for, and then it got a little more complicated at the end Yes, of the I know, it started there. out with nature so, walk. Yeah. Uh, my first thought is, uh, and because I have you know relatives in, Chicago and observed Northwest who would say, put on another layer, get something dry and go outside. Yeah. Um, you know, we're Californians and, you know, we tend not to do that. Um, but in truth, I think this winter we should take a lesson from some of our brethren uh, in colder climates and just go. Um, there are things you can do indoors, of course, uh, depending on the, your, your space available and your size of your room. And there are things like 
streaming little apps of like dance games. There's kids YouTube dance videos. I've seen my daughter taking, they do like these little breaks in her class where they get up and there's these little kid dance videos for five or 10 minutes. Or uh, my son has, we have like the Peloton app on our, on our TV and he can do like stretches and, and, you know, using his body weight for things. So there are options for indoor stuff. Um, and obviously not knowing the specifics of this question and if there's like sensory processing and other issues there that would make it more complicated. But um, I would say try to go out um, and just spray another layer and then put it in the wash when you get back in. Um, and then if not, you gotta be creative. Okay, thank you. So one more here. Do you have any suggestions? And I'm sure you hear this all the time. Do you have any suggestions for a child or teen who does not want to accept outside help, whether that's going to see a pediatrician like you or a therapist? Many parents ask this question. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really challenging. So, you know, it's, part of it, it's like, well, you feel like, gosh, I could leave the host water, but I can't make a drink sort of approach. And it's really challenging. Um, so part of it is sometimes you kind of just make an ag agreement to go together and just hear this person out and almost take like the baby step approach, like to the very first question about how to get your kid back into school after all this time. It's the same thing. It, it might be a, well, why don't we do this together? And can you just do this one time? Um, and it's, and it might take repeated exposure and it, and it will also probably take some shopping to find someone that actually clicks with, you know, this older child or teenager. Um, depending it really depends on the urgency of the situation too right like sometimes you can just say look I, I understand i know you're in a rough spot i think this will help but i'm also happy just to wait a week or talk to you more or hand, you know, do some stuff inside uh our, our own family unit um so obviously if it's urgent and there's a safety concern then you have to be more forceful um, but otherwise it's trying to encourage trying to find a way to partnership trying to find a way to compromise and just kind of get that relationship going um, it's really challenging. I know that I talk, we have a lot of kids who do that all the time. And there are some times where, you know, in my practice, we default to medication because we can't get therapy to click. Um, but in, in, in this situation we're talking about, I think it's, it's really trying to judge the severity and trying to figure out the best way to find a compromise moving forward. Okay, thank you. So we are just about at the end of our hour. So I want to end with a question that, that many people know is my favorite. So Aaron, I'm going to let you answer. And then Pamela, I'm going to give you the last word, OK? We've talked about some really hard things tonight. Dr. Nafak, what gives you hope despite everything we've been through this year? What, what makes you hopeful for our kids? Oh, so much. Um, I mean, I, the biggest hope this week, of course, is seeing the first vaccines go out. Um, and that, that is the thing that gives me the most hope uh, moving forward. Um, knowing that, um, you know, the Electoral College voted yesterday and even Mitch McConnell is called the president-elect today. So by January 20th, we'll have adults in charge of the country. It gives me great hope. <laughs> um, and then going back to what I said at the very beginning, the, the heroes that I talked about at the very beginning, the folks I see every day, my kids' teachers, uh, the, some of my colleagues working in the front lines who have been working six days a week since March. Uh, these are the people that give me hope uh, day to day. So there's a lot. I've, I'm, I'm very hopeful for the medium range future. It just seems like I was talking about earlier that we've got a couple of months that are going to be kind of a grind. On all of it. Wow. Well, thank you, Dr. Nafak. Those are beautiful words. Pamela, I'm going to give you the last word. Thank you. Am I answering uh, what gives me hope or just? Yes, yes you oh, are. Okay. okay. <laughs> so what gives me hope of, is vaccine, yes. But I think the, um, the way that the pandemic has really highlighted the inequities and the failure of our systems that I'm hopeful that this is bringing to light finally some recognition that, that disparities are real, that, um, that people um, and mental health is real challenges for people um, and that is no longer stigmatized and that we'll actually be able to take some focused approaches to addressing some of these really long-term and really systemic challenges that we've been dealing with for years that maybe this is, this is an opportunity that we'll start seeing some changes. Um, more supports for mental health now that there's awareness, more effort with, uh, uh, with by our public health, by 
by all of the, our community that we support each other, that we need to support each other better moving forward. Um, and that community is so important. I'm hopeful for that. Um, and thinking and seeing all of you here tonight, it tell, it, that, that gives me hope too, that people are really embracing any opportunity to learn and to make changes. So thank you. Thank you, Pamela, so well said. So a huge thank you tonight to Dr. Aaron Navak for your time and your expertise and to Pamela Kurtzman and everyone at the Sequoia Healthcare District. Thank you for hosting this wonderful event. Parents, we hope that you've enjoyed it and a video will be available shortly through our partners at the Boys and Girls Club of the Peninsula, also funded through the Sequoia Healthcare District. So thank you everyone, take care, happy holidays and stay well. See you soon.